a couple of things. One is that we, if you want to see the speakers, which I think is really, um, really important, that you really need to just pin the video. So you need to pin that and then whoever is speaking, um, you can hear them. Okay. So the other thing is I, I'm slightly distracted because my puppy decided that this is playtime. So I, if I go into the mode after we hang up and you just can see my, my um, portrait or whatever, I'm really here. I'm just trying to deal with this, this right now. So I'm very thrilled. I'm thrilled about the guests today. I'm thrilled about the possibilities for the future of Pittsburgh, Columbus, Columbus, Pittsburgh. And uh, I'm very excited about that. And so let me give a shout out. So we, ha we did a little networking, those who are sponsors, and I'm really hoping that we can uh, you know, continue to nurture this relationship and move forward. But I wanna talk about a couple of the people who are here today and who are sponsoring. So first of all, we have um, Covail. I wanna give special thanks to Covail. They are a member and of the Pittsburgh Tech Council and they're based in Columbus but they helped connect us with these regional leaders who are with us today. And they also have helped us think about what this relationship could look like in terms of regional. And really we're in, in Columbus's backyard and, and vice versa. It's really not that far. And as someone said in the chat, once we have the hyperloop, I will probably have a second home in Columbus because it will take me about 20 minutes to get there. So I'm pretty excited about that. And also as an undergrad from Ohio State, it would be nice to put my feet back on that campus for a little bit. So I'd like to thank our CIO sponsor, um, Insight Series sponsors. One is CGI. They were actually founded in 1976 and they're one of the world's largest IT and business consulting firms with over 400 professionals in Pittsburgh. They're very active in the Pittsburgh community and they have been in this region for 30 years. And today they've developed innovative solutions side by side with their clients. They have an innovation center, but they're very active leaders in our community and very passionate about the region. So Comcast Business, they're Comcast. Most of you have heard of that. They have a business um, side to their work. So it's not just for Comcast, all of us at home. And they are really responsible for powering Pittsburgh's top businesses that power the community and a responsibility that they take very seriously. They are very active in our community as well, and they provide a variety of enterprise solutions from network connectivity to managed services and anything that enables businesses to simplify their network in the face of innovation and allowing for technology solutions for their customers, allowing them to move rapidly, as we've seen with everyone working from home. So uh, a supporting sponsor is Avenade. They're a global professional services company providing IT consulting services um, in Pittsburgh. And they are number one Microsoft partner worldwide. They're focused on Microsoft platforms, specializing in artificial intelligence, business analytics, cloud, app services, digital transformation, the modern workplace, security services, tech and managed services offerings. Thank you, Avenade. Snowflake, Snowflake, um, helps organizations unleash the value of their data by providing an easy to use and low cost platform for managing and you know, democratizing enterprise data. They enable secure and govern data access at 100 to 200x performance over the competition and is delivered as a service with almost zero maintenance. And certainly last but not least, longtime friends of the Tech Council is Tier 1 Performance. They're an employee-owned consulting firm that activates strategies through people. They are a certified B Corporation. They're passionate about consulting, designing, and building people-centered business solutions that deliver long-term success. So thanks to all our sponsors, and I'd like to now pass the baton and introduce today's moderator, Manoj Mishra. He is the Vice President of Banking for CGI US. And Manoj is going to kick off and introduce the panelists. And I'm going to go on mute and deal with my dog. So thank you all. All right. Thank you, Audrey. Again, it's my great privilege to be, and honor to be hosting this panel discussion with leaders from both Pittsburgh and Columbus, Ohio. And as you all know, we are living in an unprecedented time. COVID-19 has essentially fundamentally changed individual and businesses. 
So we as a large organization, we are getting to see pandemic not just across industries, but also globally. And I think we do have some point of view on that. So if you look at this eye chart, you can see how different businesses and industries sort of reacted to, to the pandemic differently, right? So the way we see it, we see this pandemic unfolding in three distinct phases. We see this, and you can see it on the chart, we see this respond phase, whether, whether businesses were ready or not, they essentially were forced to respond, and they obviously responded differently based on their preparedness, their digital uh, readiness, and so on and so forth. We believe that the respond phase is over now, and we are now into this rebound phase, which is where businesses are essentially looking to get back to the pre-COVID level. And if you see this chart, it kind of shows before the crisis and where businesses are, where different industries are after the, uh, or are today. But the most important phase is yet to come, which we believe, we are calling it a reinvent phase. This is the phase where we believe industries are going to redefine how they do businesses. They're going to redefine how they work internally. They're going to redefine how they work with their clients and customers. And I think we are, we are seeing many businesses getting ready for that. And if, if they're not in the next three to six months, we will see, we'll see industries changing. And I think the world, as we all know, will be different than it was pre, pre-COVID. So again, with that background, let's jump into the panel discussion. May I request each of the panelists to introduce yourself, introduce your company and your business and IT team. So maybe if I may request Chris uh, for you to get started, please. Sure, Mesh. Thank you. I'm Chris Caruso. I'm the uh, Vice President of Information Technology at PPG. Uh, we are uh, uh, an IT organization that's uh, about 1,400 members strong uh, in 40 countries around the globe. Thank you, Chris. And uh, Catherine? Sure. Hi, Catherine Alshaus. Um, I'm the CIO and I also head up operations globally at Viva Systems. Viva is a Silicon Valley based enterprise software company that sells cloud enterprise software to life sciences businesses, specifically big pharma and others. So we have a global presence and lots of offices. Um, I head up the Columbus office for Viva and really, really happy to uh, be here joining forces with the Pittsburgh team. Thank you, Catherine. Very exciting. And uh, Gary? Good morning, uh, Gary Dick. I'm with Highmark Health, uh, located in Pittsburgh at the headquarters. We've got an IT organization of about 1,300 people, and we're supporting both the uh, AHN Hospital Network as well as the Highmark Insurance uh, family of companies. Thank you, Gary. And Leah? Good morning. I'm Ann Lee Rumpola. I uh, work for Cardinal Health. Uh, based out of Columbus, Ohio, right there in Dublin, and we are a healthcare products and services company. I am the CIO of their medical segment, and we basically provide uh, both distribution and um, we actually manufacture our own medical uh, medical products that service the acute, the acute world, and I'm um, very happy to be here and look forward to the discussion. Sure. Thank you, Anlia. So again, uh, no surprise, right? The topic today is going to be dominated by COVID-19. So my, my first question to the panel is from a business and IT perspective, how did you pivot yourself to this pandemic? What was the most challenging thing for you and what impact it had on your business so far? So if, I mean, maybe I'll request Gary to kick, uh, kick us off. There we go. Uh, yeah, I think that when you think about the, the respond phase that you mentioned earlier, I think probably the most challenging activity was we uh, typically had about you know 3,000 people working from home on a regular basis. And we had to, in a period of like two weeks, equip about 17,000 people to be working from home. And so just the logistics of going through that uh, across our company was was quite a challenge getting people the right equipment getting them set up and many of the folks that we sent home had never worked from home before and so just the whole process of, of getting them comfortable with the idea of how to connect and how to operate you know in a home setting to be productive was was a bit of a challenge and then I would say the second challenge was if you think about the hospital network you know we had telemedicine but not to the extent that we needed to accommodate uh, 
you know, during the crisis. And so ramping that up was a, another significant challenge. And then because we have so many people that still were working on premise out of the 35,000 people, we still had a large population that did have to come to the hospitals or, you know, our, our digital print shops or you know, security organizations that were on prem and just figuring out the logistics of keeping them safe. Uh, while they were reporting back to work. So that was uh, a lot of the activity the first month. It does seem like a long time ago, <laughs> uh, looking at where we are right now. Uh, thank you, Gary. Catherine, do you want to add, uh, add your perspective on that question, please? Sure. Um, on the IT side, we, so we're a young company. We, we have a really interesting, diverse group of different types of companies here, but we're a young company, 13 years old as a company. Um, 4,000 employees globally. So we have the advantage of having had a fresh start on our tech and we're actually 100% cloud. So no on no data center footprint, no on-prem servers. So our, our task was more focused on as an IT organization, just being great at end user customer service. So we proactively got our service desk folks out there, contacted every employee, made sure they have what they need. I think we processed something like 1,238 peripheral orders in you know three days or something and sent them around the world um, just to help people you know get their webcams going and get their you know their extra monitor up and all of those items that would really kind of add to productivity because we were focused on keeping everybody productive um, and kind of like Gary we had about half our workforce um, already already remote so that it wasn't a far step. I think though the, the the more interesting maybe maybe answer to that from Viva's perspective is on our software product side and how we pivoted our our um, kind of our rhythm for releasing features in our software for our customers due to the COVID pandemic. So we're right in the middle of it, right? With <laughs> with our clinical trial software, like most of the clinical trials for COVID vaccines are going through Viva software to be submitted for approval and such and all the testing and all that and the quality management is happening through Viva. So we kind of stopped dead in our tracks, looked at our product roadmap and said, what do we need to pull forward from future releases? So we pulled forward remote sampling for example, which allows um, for a completely remote touch free and visit free completion to a clinical trial. So, and also submitting samples to doctors for them to try with their patients. So the signature process, all the exchange is now all handled digitally. Um, and the other thing we tried to focus on just as an example is we made our um, secure video communications that uh, were highly regulated as a pharmaceutical data processor, um, our, our video tool that lets doctors talk with uh, their patients, that lets pharma companies talk with their HCPs in a secure and compliant manner under the federal regulations. Um, we made that free worldwide to anybody that needs it with no strings attached. Um, so we had probably half a million new users globally in the span of a month or two on that product. Um, so we're, we're focused on how we can help and what we can do as a product company to kind of pave the way um, for speed here. And it's been interesting listening to our customers talk about how the clinical trial process has been transformed through, through this pandemic. Sure. Again, thank you, Catherine. I think, and it's very, very relevant to what, what we're kind of uh, experiencing. So, Chris, from, from, your, from a PPG perspective, uh, I mean, what was, I mean, how did you pivot? What, what was the most challenging thing for you? Yeah, I, you know, uh, one of the things we found was interesting, and because we're a global company and our, our second largest uh, country that we do business in is China, we saw this early on. We saw early on... Uh, that this was coming. And so, you know, fortunately for us on the IT side, we were well prepared. We, you know, our infrastructure was uh, pretty rock solid. So we we're very fortunate in that sense. Our workforce is also distributed almost a third in, in Asia Pacific, a third in Europe, a third in the US and, and the Americas. So we were able to, you know, sort of balance out our infrastructure pretty easily. That was, that was sort of the, the easier part of this after the first couple of weeks. Um, the, the, the more interesting challenge for us uh, was really more on the business side. Um, you know, we're a pretty diverse business. Many of you know we're in paints and coatings. Um, the one I think we can all relate to is we have paint stores around the globe, almost 2,000 of them. Um, and you know, one of the <clears throat> things that almost immediately happened is we had to figure out how to quickly um, get our painters to place orders online. <clears throat> and some of us, you know, frankly, I've been involved with this business for more than two decades. We've been trying to build adoption around placing orders online 
uh, <clears throat> in this particular business for quite a while, really a struggle. <clears throat> Within the first month of COVID, it flipped on us. The, our, we had customers that wanted needed to buy paint. They couldn't come into the stores. And so very quickly in Eastern Europe, in three weeks, we were able to get up uh, an, you know, an online ordering app for our, our customers to place certain orders. So back to some of the things Catherine talked about in terms of speed, we need to react quickly in order to address the, the, you know, the changing business times that this has driven us to. Thank you, Chris. Mm -hmm. Anilia, do you want to share your perspective in terms of both in terms of how you pivoted and, and what was the most challenging thing for you? <clears throat> Yeah, I was going to reiterate um, on the infrastructure side, getting to a work from home, we, we literally, we practiced as an IT organization and we were able to kind of get the, the, the business operations working from home within less than a week, really. It was, it was way easier than what we um, had anticipated. Real work was, as you can imagine, being both a distributor and a manufacturer of products that are in need during a pandemic. Um, we had to create a program structure uh, around the dynamic areas of the business that they were just working to figure out how to respond to the pandemic. So a good example of that was, you know, uh, we had a whole new work stream around working with the government and national stockpile um, and providing a lot of data and analytics to them that we never had to before. So we had to pivot really quickly, um, figure out how to get them the information that they needed, and then um, obviously requirements changed uh, quite a bit along the way. So there was a whole new work stream working with the government. And that's just one example. Um, we, you know, we've had to kind of put more like a program structure around it because the priorities are changing so frequently. And we are at being asked to deliver on different solutions that we need to make sure that we had a coordinated effort. So um, all in all, really, um, that was probably our biggest uh, pivot is that we had to kind of reprioritize our work in a dynamic way to handle um, the, the requirements coming, coming at IT. Sure, again, thank you, Andy. And it's very interesting to see how across industries, uh, and, we, and we're seeing this, right, how each of, each of the industries essentially pivoted to the crisis and, and largely has done a phenomenal job of keeping the businesses up and running. I do want to quickly shift gears and talk about the reinvent phase, right? So I would like to understand from, from our leaders how are you reshaping your business and IT priorities? Where are you investing uh, now? What, what has changed from what, where you were investing before this pandemic? And maybe Chris, if you can lead us with that, uh, on that question, please. Sure, yeah, so we're uh, you know, doing two things, both for our employees as well as for our customers. I alluded a little bit to one example around the paint stores and getting our, getting our painter customers to, to order online. The, uh, I'll just start with the internally, you know, we, we um, uh, are, uh, we're in the middle of the, uh, planning for the rollout of Microsoft 365. We had to really rethink the whole uh, timing and layout of that in terms of what we were deploying and when. So uh, we've escalated the, the, the rollout of uh, Microsoft Teams because it's really, um, you know, our, our, uh, our user base is really driving a lot on that front. Uh, the other uh, key thing, though, as we're, we're doing that, we also want to make sure we don't just give them a tool and um, let them have at it. So there's a lot of effort around training and change management because it's really not just about doing meetings like this. It's also about how they collaborate. We want to make sure that they're, they're thinking about that. So there's a, there's a lot of effort around those kinds of activities. Um, but again, on the, on the customer side, you know, we are, have really um, started to rethink how we, we look at some of the business models. You know, we have a lot of distribution businesses, whether it's in our architectural coatings business or our, our refinished coatings for body shops. Um, that model um, has opportunities to really streamline um, and really uh, this whole COVID uh, situation is really helping to escalate that. Not just, not just build a different adoption model, but what's really changing for us is the velocity that is that's being demanded of IT to really deliver faster because I, I think a lot of our a lot of our businesses and I think someone alluded to it earlier you know this this next six to twelve months are going to be make or break uh, for a lot of businesses and if they don't adapt quickly uh, this could be quite a bit of a challenge so we're seeing it and it's coming down on the IT side in terms of our ability to deliver that the normal 18 months cycles or 12 month cycles have to be you know, 
really more like 12 or 18 weeks uh, to deliver solutions. Sure, again, thank you, Chris. And I can attest, right? We have been working with some of our clients where we delivered product in less than 10 days. Mm -hmm. So this is agile and steroids, <laughs> if I say. So again, thank you for sharing that uh, perspective. Gary, how about from a Highmark perspective? How is it changing your priorities? Where are you investing given this pandemic? Uh, well, very similar to Chris, we were on the journey for you know Microsoft 365 as well, and we really accelerated that program a lot. You know, leveraging Yammer and Teams and and the video conferencing and and really enabling the employees to get on the on track with those tools, uh, not just rolling out the technology, but also providing adoption support and, and enabling the tools. So still working through that, but you know, took a program that was going to be over a few years and it became uh, how fast can you get it done? So really moving forward with that. And that's been very helpful in, in helping with our engagement as well with the employees while they're, while they're working from home. I, I would say in the other uh, avenue on the, on the hospital side, as I mentioned earlier, you know, how can we connect you know, patients to physicians or clinicians you know, using telemedicine? And so really growing that area uh, and that opportunity quite a bit as well going forward. And then I guess the other one everybody's talked about just accelerating the speed at which you deliver, you know, capabilities. And so really adding a little bit more uh, capacity to our DevSecOps journey and how do we get our applications to the point where they can be delivered a lot faster and then how do we leverage the cloud going forward. So I would say we really stepped up our, our journey to the cloud and also stepped up you know, our focus on, you know, delivering applications with much faster time to market cycles. Yep, thank you, Gary. So again, Catherine, uh, your perspective as, as a global, I mean, uh, organization, how are you shifting your priorities? And again, you being a little bit new, uh, would be very interesting to hear your perspective on, on, on your priorities getting shifted. Sure. Um, yeah, so I guess two things. One, we're, we're we're discussing as a leadership team, and I feel like we're likely to announce soon that we're, we're just gonna go remote first permanently as a company um, globally. So we've been talking about this a lot and trying to figure out kind of what's best for the individuals and what's best for the teams. And um, we definitely wanna allow for some flexibility there, but this, this, this entire structure that has been put in place right during this time has caused a lot of deep, th we love deep thinking. We're big fans of Daniel Kahneman's Thinking Fast and Slow. So for anyone that hasn't read that, it's a good read. So we, we like to sort of stop. Oh, yes, right. Apply systems to thinking. Okay, let's think through this. Just kind of clear the desk. And, if, and when you do that for us, we kind of came up with, well, you know, let's, let's, let's keep pushing on this. Let's, let's go forward and see if remote first really works. Now that's had a, two impacts um, so far. And one is on hiring. So I was happy to participate in this panel because we're now looking at hiring regionally. So we're more, well, much more focused on time zone than we are in city. Um, so for, for hiring now, for me, uh, if I want someone to work with a team that's headquartered in Columbus, I'm looking anywhere in the Eastern or Central time zone. So it doesn't matter city um, anymore. <laughs> it, it really just matters skill set fit and that you're, now it would be hard, right, to, to work in our Singapore office with the rest of a core team that was in Columbus because there's just very little overlap, if any, um, on business hours. But time zone, I think, is a good, good approach. Um, the other thing is on our commercial real estate footprint. That's been an interesting discussion on what this means going forward because I suspect it'll end up meaning that we're in a holding pattern and that, that despite our, our accelerated growth rate with employees, we're probably fine now to, to put off and avoid future spend on, um, on real estate. So that would kind of preclude a bunch of projects we had planned or in various cities. So I, I, we still have to figure that out, but uh, looking at things like how it influences the space and much more focus on collaborative spaces and a place where people can come in and gather for a meeting, you know, spend time together and then kind of, you know, redisperse. That, that this, these are the things that's kind of making us think about right now. Sure. Thank you, Catherine. I think sometimes I wonder what's going to happen to the downtown skylines after after <laughs> post COVID. So, so Anlia, your thoughts on, on again, uh, reshaping business, reshaping priorities, where you're investing? Yeah, not to reiterate what, like, so on the, um, the collaboration, that's obviously a big one for us. We, I would say we underinvested. invested um, We had a, 
Skype and it wasn't the greatest. Um, so we were able to pivot to get people to work from home, um, but it wasn't the greatest experience. And since this is how they are you know, working day in and day out, we've aligned and we're really training and doing change management with folks around the use of Microsoft Teams. And then we've also um, brought in Zoom to our environment. So there's been shifts in that area and no different than, than uh, what others have talked about. Um, on the business application side is really um, where, you know, we're kind of looking at our IT priorities. We, we recently just finished a multi-year uh, strategy effort for our, our medical segment, which I'm, I'm responsible for. And um, where, where we have identified uh, investments uh, such as commercial enablement. So how do we go to market with our sales teams? Um, we had a point of view, but obviously when um, now you're working more remotely and in some cute, se cute settings, right, they don't even want them there. So how do you enable your sales teams with different tools or processes uh, with a change in COVID? And, and so I'd say it's a good example of where um, we had a roadmap and we have our priorities that we need to move forward. We just have now new requirements kind of coming our way with COVID as a big part of it. Um, another area to just in, is similar um, to commercial is we're transforming our global supply chain network across the globe. Um, we, we just finished an acquisition tear over like four or five years. And so, um, you know, we, we brought the, the new organizations on, but they're probably not as optimized. So we need to kind of bring uh, more of those solutions together end to end. And what we're seeing is we need to do that quicker. Um, we need more insights to the data across the end-to-end -end supply chain um, and be able to make decisions faster. So um, there's, there's some nuances to our strategy. The strategy is kind of the same, but it's that we're bringing in COVID as a, as, a, as a requirement into how we move forward. Sure, again, thank you, Anneli. And I think um, it's very interesting to, to hear from leaders, both from Columbus and Pittsburgh, and essentially you reflect what the leaders globally are talking about the priorities. So again, it's very, very insightful. So thank you for sharing that. So Andy, I'm gonna ask you to stay and then, and then reflect on the next question. And this is, a, this is a very standard question. What's keeping you up at night? What's getting you worried? What, what, concern, what concerns that you have on top of your mind? And then the second part of the question is, what help do you need from the tech community, from your partners, in, in this journey or, or to elevate some of the thing that worries you? So what keeps me up at night? Um, it's basically, uh, you know, I think the people aspect of, of all of this. Um, I think we've proven to be very successful in working remotely, but what's the cultural sustainability of this work from home? Um, and how do we, engage new employees. Like um, I have a nephew that actually just started at Cardinal uh, during the pandemic and he's never once stepped in a facility. Um, and so how do you create those connections when you're, you're sitting in, you know, a bedroom on your laptop doing work every day? And yes, it's nice. I see you smiling there and, and it's, but it's very different than, you know, having that connection to the organization. So I think one of the things um, that keeps me up on that is just more the cultural aspect of it. Um, and so where, where do we need help? I mean, we think of um, the sales example that I gave, um, what, what can we do to enable our, our sales teams in, in a different way um, when you're dealing more virtually? What are some of the um, you know, tools that could apply, et cetera? What in the global supply chain space could we do to gain better insights faster? across the end-to-end -end supply chain. And, and believe me, a lot of our partners are, um, you know, looking at this as an opportunity to help us out. But there's, you know, there's, there's a lot of new application of um, really data and analytics in new ways um, that we really need to pursue. And that's where we could use, you know, continued help and advice from partners. Sure, again, thank you, Anilia. So Chris, mm -hmm. same question to you, and again, uh, given uh, your industry is very different from, from healthcare and primarily been uh, brick and mortar. So how, how do you see tech playing this role uh, and what help can tech do as an extension of the, the question that I asked before? Yeah, I, well, first of all, I just have to add to Anlia. I mean, I, you know, our, my biggest concern is around engagement of, of, of our team, but certainly across the, the company. You know, this whole remote work, and I think we're all, we all know we're gonna be working more remotely one way or another, you know, whether it's full-time or part-time. 
And, you know, at, at some point in time, um, the, the, our, our IT teams are gonna, if they don't feel like they're a part of PPG, whether the culture or they're engaged with their team members, um, at some point they're gonna look up and say, well, you know, I can work remotely for anybody, right? So this, this is sort of, I think this is a dynamic that we're all gonna have to deal with. And so, uh, you know, I'm really focused and my team's focused on how are we gonna continue to keep um, our teams engaged uh, in this process. The other side of this is really about, um, you know, for me, back to the business side of it is, you know, how we can move more quickly. You know, we, we've had to um, get really good at prioritization. Um, you know, as, as we all know, when, the, when we were faced with challenging times in IT, and I've, I've been doing this for almost 40 years now, you know, in more challenging times, the more greater demand for IT. But, you know, we're, we're all under cost pressures. And it's really about, so, you know, we have more demand, less resources. How do we do that um, and do it faster? So that's going to be the other side. So what, what are the techniques? What are the technologies that are going to be, allow us to deliver solutions faster than, than we've ever done before? So that, that would be the other thing that would keep me up at night. Sure. Thank you, Chris. And, uh, and Catherine, your perspective, what, what's keeping you up at night and, and what help you need from the tech community? Uh, I'm with Ann Lee and Chris on this. Uh, it's the people side of it. And um, yeah, we can, you know, make the best calls we can as a leadership team for the company. But in the end, it, it's, it's about what works for the individual. And, um, and, and I guess in our view, we were thinking about um, the, 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 an individual's priorities, right? And kind of the order in which those might go for them or maybe should go for them, which is where's my family? You know, how do I build a lifestyle and life that allows me to retain those close connections? What community do I want to live in? What's meaningful to me? And then my career and, and where's my job? So if we, if we think about those things in that order and try to align with that, that level of life prioritization, then you kind of land in this place where, well, okay, then let's try to, let's try to build something, you know, that accommodates that. But, but that, that still doesn't erase the fact that it's different. And uh, I worry about people finding solutions to their childcare, women and men finding solutions to their childcare problems at home. I, I worry about, um, people feeling like they, they really want to do a great, engaged, productive job at work, but are feeling that stress because they're having to shift their working hours. And, uh, you know, I know everyone here has done the same thing. We've been really accommodating where if you see, you know, COVID-19 homeschooling block for kindergarten, you know, between nine and 11, then, you know, you just kind of a figure that they're probably moving those hours somewhere else in their day and that's great for them and, you know, kind of no, no problem. But I think that level of flexibility has got to continue. Um, the one thing we've thought of that works for our already remote teams globally is to build in time um, after this pandemic is over, when we, if we move to a remote first model where everyone ha every team ha finds a way that's meaningful to them to physically come together a couple of times a year at least because Anley's right that building that human connection, it, it really can't be done 100% effectively with only this, this Zoom. It, we really, you know, as humans kind of need that time together to see each other's physical reactions and go out to eat together and work on a problem together collaboratively, you know, with a physical whiteboard, just kind of no substitute for that. Um, but if we figure out how to get the blend right <laughs> of um, building that in to an otherwise remote model, then I, th I think that could be a good direction. We're all feeling our way forward here. Nobody's got the right answers. Could be wrong. But that, that seems like it might, might be a, a way forward for us. But that, as you can tell, I've thought a lot about this. That's what's keeping me up at night is the people side of it. Sure. Again, thank you, Catherine. And I think, I'll, Gary, do you want to add anything to to that, what's your perspective? What do you, what is keeping you up at night? Well, I think, you know, echoing what was talked about before, there's just a huge level of uncertainty right now in people's lives. And that has to be taking a toll on them from a, a stress standpoint and, you know, having some impact on their ability to focus on work. And so just trying to figure out, you know, how do we create an environment that, that adds some degree of certainty for folks going forward. So as Chris pointed out, you know, and others, we've been very flexible with the idea of you know, let people work from home and, and giving them lots of, of lead time from that standpoint and being very flexible with letting them take care of family activities. So that's helped. But I do have the concern, you know, 
as we talked about onboarding, because we've talked about onboarding folks as well. And, you know, it's just very unusual now to onboard somebody and, and not have the, the mentoring meetings in the team meetings and the, the activities planned and the, the celebration of their first, you know, month or so with a dinner or something or a lunch or, you know, going to have a round table with them in person and, and getting them to open up. And it people typically don't open up quite as much over a video call as they would, you know, 10 or 12 people around a table you know, having lunch or something like that. And so I'm just concerned about being able to get people connected with the organization in that first, you know, six months or so, because a lot of times that determines like their long-term engagement, you know, over time. And so a lot of concern there. And also, you know, with the concept of developing future leaders for the organization, you know, a lot of the leadership development happens through interpersonal relationships and, and coaching and mentoring, not formal, you know, video meetings for 30 minutes. And so uh, just thinking, you know, turning the clock forward a few years, you know, how that's going to be different, uh, you know, developing future managers and, and people leaders and directors throughout the organization. And then, you know, you ask about the tech, tech stuff, you know, there's a lot of uncertainty now on, on just where the businesses are going to be going and, and, you know, what our footprint's going to look like. But many of us, you know, we sign rather long-term deals with a lot of our partners and tech partners and things like that. So probably looking for some flexibility, you know, as we plan things out over the next year or so, I feel like, you know, things that we were planning, you know, three years ago or two years ago as part of our strategy, you know, several of them will likely get upended and we'll have to be working with our tech partners to provide, you know, that business support perhaps in a different way. Sure. Again, thank you, Gary. And I think I must, I must say this, right? It's very heartening to see all the leaders actually talking about the people side of it, right? And so, because at the end of the day, it's impacting all of us, uh, all your employees, all, 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 all our team members. So again, uh, very encouraged to see that conversation where I think the top thing on your mind is engagement, people, and how it concerns them. So it's very, very, very encouraging to, to see that. So again, thank you all for sharing that that perspective. So again, that's a good segue into something that's on top of everyone's mind, right? Return to work. So the question that I have for the panelists is, what is that going to look like for your team? How are you planning to return to work? Uh, what is the new normal going to look like? And, and what help do you need? So Catherine, if you would, uh, you, know, you would lead us on that, please. What help do we need? So um, we, I, I, I think there's probably several areas. Um, thinking through this, this topic we were just concluding, right, about how to keep everybody engaged, that's not a traditional IT consulting topic, right? I mean, it, I, I've heard from some of the partners and sponsors in this group that they actually are starting to think about focusing on that, which is fantastic because in, you know, six months ago, I probably couldn't have called up the, the people I would typically pick up the phone and call and say, you know, that's great that you have developers and JavaScript people and BAs and PMs, but, and I need those, but what I'm really focused on now is how people can connect with each other and how people talk together. It's a softer, it's a much softer discussion, right? Um, but I, I know that expertise is out there. It just may not have been kind of on the front of the shingle people were hanging out before, but I need to kind of know where to find that now. Um, and, and I would also suspect that some of these great consulting companies that have been around and kind of got some pattern recognition in other companies of what works well and what maybe doesn't work well in that space, while it may not have been something, you know, sort of a primary offering before, I bet they know, right? I bet they've seen a lot of things and could really, you know, kind of develop an offering that would help uh, companies think through this process. So I guess I would encourage those that are helping us out to, um, you know, use your expertise that you're, you've developed and may not have even realized it on organizational dynamics and how, um, how, how what good looks like and what best looks like in an IT department, especially uh, with these things, because uh, customer engagement and keeping our own employees engaged with each other and techniques to do that, I think are, are really front and center. So that, that would be my kind of, my thing I would throw in the pot. Again, very, insi very insightful, Catherine. So Anlia, your perspective, right? So what do you think the new normal will look like? How do you think the return to work will all pan out? Again, I know we don't have a crystal ball, but, and then uh, back to the second part of it, what help do you think you need from the tech community on that? Yeah. Um, for our 
our organization, we have frontline workers today, right? So we have warehouse workers and manufacturing workers that are, you know, going in every day. And so we've learned, you know, what the protocols need to be in order to keep them safe and um, if things happen, et cetera. So our return to work for them has not really changed. They, they still needed to go in because we need them to, to deliver on the goods and services that we're providing. I, I would say on the, the, the office workers, um, in addition to what Catherine said, we're, uh, we sent out a survey. Um, I think the whole idea around what to do with um, childcare, uh, where we're, we wanted people to volunteer to say, would you be willing to come in and work for a while and help us? Because I don't think we really know what it's gonna look like when we return to work. We wanna pilot it. Um, we wanna get feedback. We wanna adjust accordingly. Um, we are in the middle of that process. Our hope is that we would get a pilot group after the Labor Day period of time. And then we would take that feedback and adjust. Um, we are seeing though that we didn't get a lot of volunteers because um, the, the whole, the, we have, you know, childcare I think is a big issue that we need to um, think about as an organization. Um, there's a lot of schools that are still not you know, haven't, haven't decided about what, what the go back to school is, is all about. So um, we're, we're kind of just in that formulation stage. I would say, what do we need from partners would be, you know, or even just, you know, collaborations like this, just as people do go back to work, how do, how do we learn from each other versus everybody just trying to figure it out on their own? Um, what are the, what are some techniques that we could do to, you know, make sure that we are hearing from our employees, how they're feeling? What is it? What do we need to do differently? So, yeah, unfortunately, we're you know we're kind of uh, going to be way more conservative about returning to work. We feel the broader um, needs of healthcare. We don't want to risk our operations by going too fast. So, I think Chris, you might have been the one that said you probably wouldn't go back until a vaccine. I mean, I we haven't really said that, but I would think we're going to be more slow to get back to work and um, really kind of take our time. Sure. Again, thank you, Anilia. So, so Gary, as a large organization, right? Again, how do you see this whole return to work uh, changing, and what are your thoughts on on that, and what help do you need? Well, I think as was mentioned earlier, you know, about half of our folks are already, you know, reporting to work every day just because of the job functions that they need to accomplish. They need to be, you know, in the clinical environment or manufacturing environment and so you know for those it's just about you know keeping them safe and making sure that we're providing a, a good environment for them to to be productive in while they report into the office for the other half of the folks you know we we haven't picked a date or, or gone but it will be a slow methodical return to work for those that are coming back I do think a couple things we have talked about especially in the IT world is that you know it's unlikely that everybody will come back. There will be some people that will probably move more to a work from home, you know, model. And then I think we'll probably have, like we're probably not gonna just house people in the office to do independent work. You know, if you're gonna be doing more independent work, you could probably spend that time at, at home doing independent work. And so we're thinking about what will the office look like to be set up in such a way that when people come to the office, they're coming for the purpose of collaboration and, and doing the things that they can't do well from home. And so thinking the office space might be looking a bit different when people do start coming back. And I, I feel like we'll have a lot more people, especially in the IT space, that it, like right now you might have a teleworker or somebody comes to the office. I think we'll have a lot more people that'll come in a couple days a week and stay home a couple days a week. And when they do come to the office, they'll be coming for, for very purposeful activities that they can be more productive, you know, interacting with one another. So still working to sort that out. Uh, I don't see a, a rush to get back people back into the office from an enterprise. I think they've committed to, you know, really evaluating the situation and, and you know, they don't want to be the, the first ones to get everybody back in the office. I think we'll, we'll take a very measured approach to it. Sure. Again, thank you, Gary. So, and, and Chris, from your perspective, I know you talked about not coming back to work uh, till there's a vaccine but once once things comes back to work how would how do you think your new normal would look like and what help do you need yeah i and uh well yeah and, and by the way that's that's the chris caruso opinion not necessarily <laughs> the pvg opinion uh but you know first of all i think one of the interesting things and i've talked to several of the cios about this 
you know, what, one of the phenomena we're seeing is not only do people want to work remotely more because they because it works and we, we feel more productive, we're seeing people who are, you know, we hired into our Pittsburgh location and everybody, you know, who's from Pittsburgh knows PPG Place and that's a, you know, iconic building, but we've hired them to Pittsburgh. Now they're saying, okay, what's remote, right? Remote isn't necessarily Pittsburgh. Um, we have had uh, a real increase in the number of employees asking, I want to move to the other part of the country because I can work remotely from anywhere, right? So that's going to present a whole nother set of challenges that I think will be interesting for all of us to deal with uh, because remote can be as remote as you want it to be. Uh, but beyond that, I think the real challenge that I see is, you know, we have a lot of technology. And as I said, we're, we're rolling out uh, Microsoft 365, but it's really, we're not, we know how to use the tools. We just don't know how to collaborate digitally. And I think, and it's, it's as much, um, you know, there's a little bit of technology, uh, I think that we, and we're looking at some things that let allow people to be a little more spontaneous uh, in terms of how they collaborate um, in, with, their, with their teams. But so there, there's a piece of that, but it's also, you know, just a change in how we work. You know, my, my biggest concern, frankly, is we, you know, we've, we've all experienced this where we've given tools to our users and they figure out ways to really misuse them, right? And I think we all have them, mine's SharePoint, um, that I always hold up as sort of the, 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 the example of a technology we didn't probably properly use. That would be my greatest concern with a lot of these tools. We need to help people not just give them the tools, but help them be really productive with them. Sure, thank you, Chris. And you're not the only one with SharePoint. I, I think everybody <laughs> I still don't know how to use SharePoint the right way. So, so I think I'm hearing two, two uh, things, uh, right? I think I, hearing from all the leaders that you are in no rush, right? You're, you're, you're thinking it very, very carefully. And then the other theme that I hear from all of you is looking at office as a place to collaborate and not just go to work. So I think again, very interesting uh, thought there. And this, this is a very uh, favorite question that I love to ask all the leaders and executives. So, so Chris, I'm gonna start with you. What's the one long lasting effect of COVID-19 that you think that will happen in your industry? Like really long lasting, 10 years from now, you'll say this COVID changed it. Yeah, I think, well, you know, I'll, I'll just use one of our business model. Uh, you know, I, when you're in the distribution business, um, you know, we, one of our biggest competitors um, you know, has a lot of stores uh, here in North America uh, and we only have a fraction of them. And I think, this will change that. This will, will, you know, we've, you know, looked at this for well over a decade around how digital can change how people think about buying paint. We all know it's a, it's a difficult decision. Anyone who's done it, you, you need to see the color on your walls you need, and, you, and spend time in the stores. That's one area that people are not buying online, uh, you know, very much. This, I believe, is going to change that. I think people don't want to go into those stores. They want to find another way in, in order to, to buy their paint. Um, and I think there's going to be a fundamental shift um, that will make those brick and mortar stores more of an anchor uh, than anything else going forward. Very interesting. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. So, Anilia, again, from your industry perspective, uh, what's one long lasting effect that you see on Cardinal Health and your business? Actually, two, I'll be quick. One is just looking at our supply chain, you know, as, a, as, a, as you can imagine, you know, um, where product is made, you know, maybe it needs to be more regionally um, versus being, you know, centrally located in Asia versus, you know, maybe we should have some closer to the United States or Latin America. So like I'm looking at our supply chain and where products are made, the geopolitical kind of aspect of it has really not been um, something that, you know, we really focused on. And, you know, obviously that's just something we need to look at from a sustainability. Um, the second thing though, is just better business continuity planning and um, not just internally uh, looking at business continuity, but how do we partner with our suppliers and our customers to think through scenarios that like, like this, like this pandemic where um, we're not figuring it out along the way, right? We've kind of thought through those scenarios and you're not just looking at it for, for the organization that you're in, but in the whole ecosystem. So I think those are two things that will change um, for us going forward. Sure, very good. Again, thank you, Anlia. Catherine, your thoughts? 
Yeah, I think uh, two quick areas. One is our, the industry that we're in. So the I, I was just listening to an executive from Gilead that runs our global commercial services operations. Um, she says that a, a multi-year clinical trial, which was the previous model, right, uh, will now never be okay again now that everyone has seen said clinical trials run in months. So while nobody's in a rush to, you know, move every drug to the COVID vaccine model, it has definitely forced, um, a, you know, long-term positive, good, hard look at business processes inside our customers, um, you know, supply chain models to see how, how that clinical trial process could be speeded up, which is a good positive outcome out of this. And um, our, th these companies run hard. They are uh, absolutely focused. Life sciences will solve this problem, you guys. <laughs> um, but to, to do that, they're, they're being very self-reflective and reinventive of how they run, which is really, really great to see. Um, and then the other quick thing is, is back to the people again. And so somebody asked a question in the chat, Audrey did. Um, for, for us, the long-term effect of this has sped up the process of Silicon Valley companies figuring out that all of the talent really kind of migrates into Silicon Valley from other places. So why wouldn't you just move your building to where the talent is? So um, we figured that out. We put our building in Columbus. We love it. We're super happy. And um, Salesforce put their building next door in Indianapolis. They're super happy. So uh, this, what happened is this pandemic has accelerated that process, that light bulb going off of, okay, wow, we don't all need to compete just for the set of people that picked up and made the move to the Bay Area, we can um, spread that out and find talent everywhere. So that, that's definitely another trend I've seen accelerating. Sure. Yep. Thank you, Catherine. And I think you're right. Once you start delivering something fast, there's no going back. Yeah. You've set the customer expect expectation right there. So, so Gary, I think from I mean, very interesting to hear your perspective, you have been in the industry for long. I think healthcare is a... So how do you see, again, one long-lasting change in... in, in your industry that that you foresee yeah well i'll start with perhaps it so first so a couple things i see just with our organization one i don't know about the rest of you but the one exciting thing for me is i don't think i've signed a piece of paper in in probably four months and i used to get stacks up in a folder to sign so we've uh really went digital with all of our our e-signatures and things like that so that kind of turned the point where we've been talking about it, but kind of forced that to happen. So I imagine in the future, people won't even remember a day when they actually sign documents. So that, that's been pretty, uh, I would say that'll be a post COVID change. The other one is that, you know, we were pretty traditional with people coming to the office and, you know, occasionally people would work from home, but I think more often than not, they'd come into the office. And I think that's going to be, uh, something that turns turns out to be very different post COVID where we'll look back and say that it'll be very unlikely that people come to the office five days a week and, and work there. Uh, we'll probably have a, a mix of people coming in and out of the office and then staying home that will point to COVID as the turning point. And then I also think from the standpoint of how healthcare is delivered, I think a lot of folks will, will, continue doing these telemedicine visits and you know in the past you know you would typically take some time off of work you'd go to your physician office or go to the hospital and, and you'd have your your appointment and for a 15 minute appointment you might allocate you know a half day vacation or something like that to do that or a, or a 20 minute appointment and I think many of us in the future will will leverage the telemedicine and and look back on that as, as something you can be pretty flexible on where you are when you have that that appointment scheduled and finished and so i think that'll be a big change you know going forward i also think our office places will look different you know uh a year or two from now for the times we do come into the office you know we had a focus on how many people can we fit on a floor you know in the highmark building downtown pittsburgh and success was getting the most people you possibly could you know into that that floor for real estate purposes, but I think it's gonna change dramatically over the next couple of years and we'll look back to this time that kind of caused many of us to redesign our office space. Sure, thank you Gary. So no more dense packing, right? I think COVID kind of changed that uh, uh, for good. So I think we, we are getting a lot of, I mean, a lot of discussion on the chat. There are some questions coming. So I'm gonna throw this question for anyone who wants, to, this is coming from someone on, on chat. Have you seen an increase in cyber threats now that, that we have moved to a fully remote model? So again, uh, anybody on the panel who wants to take that question? Yeah, this is Gary. I, uh, we have seen, seen that, especially through phishing and, and different things like that. And you know, we 
all of us have read about the hacking going on, you know, related to some of the sites that are providing COVID updates and, and information about, you know, health of different areas. But I, I really feel like during a crisis, people are, are reaching out and, and seeking more information than normal. And they're, they're more interested in learning more about it and they become more susceptible. And I also feel like even when you have more people working from home, uh, you know, they might even be a little bit more casual about thinking about fishing and different things like that because they're not in the office environment. And so we have noticed uh, an uptick in both the, uh, the number of uh, active things going on in the world, as well as, you know, having to continue to remind our folks, you know, to be extra diligent you know, with phishing attacks and, and also, you know, leading to ransomware and things like that. So just being very cautious in that, in that space. Sure. Again, thank you, Gary. Any, any other, I mean, anyone else wants to add, uh, Catherine and Leah, Chris, you want to add your perspective from a cyber threat perspective? Uh, sure, I could chime in. We definitely saw an increase in phishing. Um, just as I'm going to plug a government group, which might sound like a weird sentence, but um, the, there's a regular business call I participate in that's uh, put on by CISA, which is the security um, business community focused portion of DHS. And it's really interesting. And they have businesses from all industries across the country on the call, and they talk about uh, what they're seeing and how there's kind of cybersecurity uh, focus, their, their group is giving advice to companies, a lot of free tools on how to combat phishing, but also other types of trends. They talk about China, which is always an interesting issue if you do business in China. Um, they talk about a lot of different uh, ideas impacting everybody. So it's a great call. You can just get on it by searching for CISA and, you know, figuring out how to join. But uh, phishing is up. The other other stuff, not so much. Um, we don't, our production security team is seeing pretty much what they normally see as far as attack vectors and, and uh, services. So, yep. Sure. Thank you, guys. Three. And Leah, Chris, you any thoughts? Uh... Nothing else to share. Similar. Sure. Okay. Yeah, we're, we're, we're the same here, too. We saw, certainly saw a, a higher uh, incident rate. We, a lot of them blocked through some of our uh, detection software, so, but, but clearly a greater threat. Our, 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 we've continued our internal phishing program. Good news is, you know, I was a little concerned that, that folks would be a little more relaxed being at home and not thinking about it as much, um, but we continue uh, to be in the right, right place there. So, uh, so that part feels good. But we have had to remind people that as they're working at home, you know, from a confidentiality and, and, and from a, uh, an intellectual property standpoint, the office is now open up to a lot of other people. Um, so it's re really required us to re-educate people who aren't used to working from home about that aspect of uh, protecting our assets as a company. Because it, it's really a completely different audience now that could, could uh, get involved. Sure. Again, thank you. I think this has been a great, a lot of insight. I'm sure I would love to replay and kind of listen to some of that. So, and I hope, uh, Monica, there's an option to do that. But as a closing comment, I'm going to request each panelist uh, to, I mean, 30 seconds, what advice do you have for your CIO peers, both in Pittsburgh and Columbus? As I said, this is a unique opportunity. So maybe, Chris, start with you. What advice do you have for your CIO peers? Yeah, I think... Uh... These kinds of events are tremendous, especially in times of crisis. You know, I've been involved with, with several groups like this and, you know, some of my friends are on this uh, session as well. And, you know, we really, uh, you know, we, there's so much we can learn from each other, right? And this is just a great opportunity to do that. I've picked up a few, uh, few ideas along the way here too. So I really appreciate having the opportunity to do that. Sure, and Leah, closing remarks, what advice do you have for your CIO peers? There's some information going on in the chat that was what I thought about it when I looked at this question, which is how do we look at talent? Um, how do we leverage a group like this to um, look at broadening our talent pool? You know, I don't know about Pittsburgh, but, you know, Columbus has been growing and we have been able to kind of attract new talent. But, you know, maybe there's different ways of looking at our teams where it's more remote. And um, so how do how do we take advantage of that to get the best talent for our team? So I, I would say that's one thing is like, use it as a, use this whole COVID as a, as a way of improving how we upgrade our, our teams uh, over, over time, so. Yep, thank you, Andrea. Never waste a, never waste a crisis, right? So yeah. Catherine, your thoughts? 
Uh, yeah, I'll um, I'll agree with my with my peers there with Chris and Inley. I you know I always feel a little guilty after these because I feel like I learn more than I <laughs> than I might impart. But um, it's uh, I think these opportunities are great. I I, I thank you for um, sharing insights. I I I really value hearing um, how other people and other businesses that are like alike and yet not alike uh, to to the one I work in. Um, to, to hear kind of how you're solving problems and thinking through things. That's really, really um, helpful. So I guess one ask would be, let's continue that. But the second, definitely agree with the chat from Audrey and Enley about talent, um, broadening our thinking about um, beyond our, our city borders, I think is a really, really healthy thing to do and, and look at this together as a, as a region. Um, I think that's a great, that's a great initiative. I'm, I'm in. Sure. Thank you, Catherine. And yeah. Gary, bring us bring us home. I mean, your 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 closing comments, advice to your CIO peers. Well, I think as many other mentioned, is just stay connected with your people. And sometimes, you know, when you get through a crisis, it's a real opportunity to help grow and develop your teams for them to do their literally do their best work of their careers is is during times of crisis because that really provides stretch opportunities that often aren't available you know, in more of our business as usual times. So I think that would be one. And then I think the other one we touched on a little bit is don't underestimate the change leadership that needs to happen during these times. Because as Chris pointed out, a lot of times we deliver the, the solutions, but we, we probably don't invest what we need to on change leadership and, and enablement and adoption. And so I'd really encourage everybody to make that a, a priority and really measure the success of the adoption, especially in the area of collaboration tools or as we move towards more of a digital footprint. Thank you, Gary. And again, I want to thank all the panelists. Great discussion. Thank you so much for your time. And I, I enjoyed this a lot. I hope everyone did the same. So Monica, Audrey, back to you. So thank you, Minaj. I just want to do a quick wrap up. First of all, really appreciate the conversations in the chat. Uh, I put my email in there in, ca in case you don't know how to get a hold of me. I'm pretty easy to get a hold of, but I love this idea about Pittsburgh, Columbus, Columbus, Pittsburgh, figuring out the talent issues and, and partnering. We are a region, believe it or not, people think of Columbus, Pittsburgh around the world as just inches apart from each other. So there's no reason why we shouldn't be collaborating. So I'm very stoked and very psyched about the people who have been on this call, both in Pittsburgh and Columbus. And I just want to tell everyone so that on August uh, 12th, we have two events, actually. We have another CIO Insights, which includes the CIO of Pitt, the Airport Authority, and uh, Nationwide. And it's followed by TechFest. And then on the 24th, crossing our fingers, we actually are doing a safe distancing golf outing that's focused on our and CIOs. It's mostly for CIOs and uh, people who want to get next to them. It usually is a huge blast, a ton of fun, whether you golf or not. Um, if anyone from Columbus wants to make the drive to Pittsburgh, we would love that, but we're going to make sure that it's separate carts, et cetera. So, and we won't be able to eat together and do all the cool things that we usually do. But, um, and then August 31st, Cyberg will be hosting a three day event. So the panel and keynote announcements will be made soon. We have some great, um, people who are speaking and love to extend it to our friends in uh, Columbus. And then every day, for those of you in Columbus that you might not know since COVID, um, we've been, I've been hosting a show called Business as Usual. And I think today's our 93rd show. And I can send you the link so you can see the kinds of people that we've interviewed. Everyone from the head of the FCC to the head of OSHA to our, some of our local rock stars, everything has been focused around what's changing in our worlds, including the topics that we're talking about today. It's been our way of keeping the tech community tethered. We probably have had over 3,500 attendees to date, and uh, it's been pretty incredible in terms of we do it for 30 minutes, so it's really bite-sized and snappy, and our intent is just to keep um, the community tethered. So on that note, I'm very, very honored to have met some folks that I never met before, and I hope that we work on some stuff. I hope that we can look at Columbus, Pittsburgh, Pittsburgh, Columbus, and realize we're facing the same issues, but we're also facing the same opportunities. So really great, thank you. 
to our panel. Thanks for taking the time and being so candid with us. And stay connected to us. That's all I can tell you, and we'll stay connected to you. So thank you, Monica, for pulling this together. And if anyone has ideas in the future, just let us know. If you think we need to convene a small group on talent, I'm happy to help facilitate that. So thanks, everyone, and have a great rest of the day. And sorry about my dog in the beginning. <laughs>